The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. Whatever you want to talk about. Could war with Iran be on the horizon? What happens now that Trump is impeached? It's your chance to sound off. Get ready for a special edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers, featuring your voicemails. Call us now at 800-677-7884. Leave a message and hear what Pat has to say about what you want to know on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club, walking it back. Both the U.S. and Iran standing down for now. Still, President Trump is calling for new sanctions against the regime and vowing that on his watch, Iran will never have nuclear weapons. So what happens next? Jenna Browder has the latest. Tensions are lowering after President Trump addressed the nation. Yesterday, Congress was also briefed on the situation with Iran, and now lawmakers are moving to limit the president's war powers. New video shows Iran's missiles launched at two U.S. bases in Iraq Tuesday. Satellite images revealing the damage. The chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, General Mark Milley, telling reporters the missiles were meant to kill personnel. But Iran also warned Iraq of the impending attack. And no Americans or coalition forces died. Proof President Trump says Iran is standing down. But he did call for new sanctions against the regime. The fact that we have this great military, we do not want to use it. American strength, both military and economic, is the best deterrent. On Capitol Hill, a duel of words between Senators Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer over the president's decision targeting Iran's General Soleimani and attempts to limit the president's ability to respond to future attacks from Iran. For our part, I certainly hope our own congressional delegations do not give Tehran a reason to question our national will. I'm afraid that these impulsive and erratic actions throughout the world are making us less safe. And mixed reaction from senators briefed by the administration's national security team on the justification for taking out Iran's top terrorist. It was very well done. Uh, I think they've done an excellent job of outlining the rationale behind both the uh, decision to go after Soleimani and the response uh, to the uh, Iranian attack yesterday. It is a far cry from meeting a standard of imminent threat. Probably the worst briefing I've seen, at least on a military issue, in the nine years I've served in the United States Senate. Republican Senators Mike Lee from Utah and Rand Paul of Kentucky vowing to vote with Democrats to limit the president's war powers. This morning, Vice President Pence telling Fox News the intelligence was solid. Right. The leadership in Congress in the House and Senate has seen this intelligence. And frankly, the most compelling uh, intelligence to support the fact that there was an eminent attack being developed by Qassam Soleimani is frankly too sensitive to share broadly. It would compromise what we call sources and methods. But later today, the House is expected to pass its resolution that makes it clear if the president wants to go to war, he must first get the approval of Congress. Iran says their attack is the end of it, but analysts say there could be more on the way and warn of possible cyber threats. DHS has alerted law enforcement agencies. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, thanks, Jenna. In other news, new questions about the plane crash that happened just hours after the Iran's attack on U.S. bases. Did the Iranians shoot down that 737? John Jessup has more on that story. Pat, Ukraine is now saying that it believes that a missile strike or terrorism could have caused the jet to crash just minutes after takeoff from Tehran International Airport. Iran denies it shot down the plane, a Boeing 737 operated by Ukrainian International Airlines. Iran's report suggests a mechanical failure, but some analysts say the photos look more like an explosion, pointing to what looks like holes caused by shrapnel like those on the Malaysia flight that was shot down over Ukraine in 2014. 
The pilots never sent a radio message announcing an emergency, and Iran refuses to hand over the black boxes to the United States or Boeing. Several international airlines announced they're rerouting or canceling flights to avoid passing through Iraqi or Iranian airspace. Well, Democratic senators are calling on House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to send the articles of impeachment to the Senate so a trial can begin. West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin joined Senators Dianne Feinstein, Richard Blumenthal, and others, saying it's time to turn over the articles. The House passed two articles of impeachment against President Trump back in December, but Speaker Pelosi says she won't send them until Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell reveals more details about the trial process. McConnell responded, quote, saying there will be no haggling with the House over Senate procedure. Pat? Well, it's time to get that thing done. I mean, Pelosi is playing a game that is just blowing up in her face. Uh, it's, they said we have to impeach because it's an imminent threat. We've got to do it right now. The president is out of control, and we've got to get this impeachment. Once they pass the impeachment, then she says, well, I've got to wait until I find out what the Senate's going to do. The Senate should not be controlled by the House. The Speaker of the House is acting on her own, and it's blowing up in her face. And so now the fact that there are Democratic defectors in the, in the Senate who are saying, let's get this thing over with. And I think, you know, there was a statement in the old days, politics stops at the, at the, at the ocean, at the, at the uh, banks of, of the Atlantic or the Pacific. We don't carry our politics into national affairs, and the president cannot be under this problem when he's facing incredible dangers from a number of sources. Well, there's something else that's been going on. It's called flu, and John has that word. That is right, Pat. The flu epidemic in the United States is turning deadly. The CDC reports at least 27 children have died so far. The tragic news indicates we're experiencing one of the worst flu seasons in recent history. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson brings us the latest. More people have the flu now than at this point during the most severe flu seasons in the past decade. Okay. How long have you been sick? Since October, nearly six and a half million people across the country have come down with the flu. Widespread outbreaks in nearly each state led to 2,900 deaths, according to the CDC, as well as 55,000 hospitalizations. Every year there are different strains of flu, and some can be more serious than others, and this year is a particularly nasty one. Doctors still maintain the flu vaccine provides the best protection, and it's not too late to get one. Hand washing also goes a long way towards prevention, as well as trying to strengthen your immune system. You eat the right foods, so get rid of sugar, processed foods which suppress your immunity. Eat whole foods, lots of vegetables and whole grains and nuts and seeds. Vitamin D can also help. Studies have shown that you can reduce the flu by 75% by getting your vitamin D levels up, and almost 80% of Americans are low in vitamin D. Studies show exercise boosts immunity and can help you get a good night's sleep, another way to fend off the flu. Sleep, so important for your immune system. Get eight hours sleep, turn off all the lights in your bedroom early, get uh, your phone out of your bedroom, stay off the screens. The flu is contagious, so if you get it or think you have it, stay away from other people and visit the doctor right away. <coughs> Symptoms include cough, aches, and fever. New antiviral medications can be prescribed to lessen the severity and duration of the illness. They work best if taken within two days of getting sick. <laughs> Lori Johnson, CBN News. Pat Laurie's report there gives us great tips on how to avoid the flu. As you know, this vitamin D is a big deal, and vitamin D, from what I, my reading has indicated, is really a hormone rather than a vitamin. And if it's coupled with a little bit of sunlight, it'll make a huge difference. But you can take a huge dose of vitamin D without infecting yourself, because if you're exposed to the sun, you might get a million units of vitamin D just by sitting in the sun. So. Yeah, uh, easier to do in the summer than right now. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I don't take shots and stuff, but I, I did what Laurie said. I eat very properly. I'm taking all kinds of vitamins, and oh, let's just stay strong. All right, what's next? <laughs> well, up next, you called, and Pat's about to answer your voicemail questions. A special edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers is coming up next.
Welcome back to the 700 Club. Well, we received an overwhelming number of calls, and uh, we are so excited to be sharing some of those and, of course, to hear your answers, Pat. Well, it seems to me that's very popular. People are just hungry for knowledge about the Bible, about human conduct, about world affairs. So we're taking a special time just to answer your questions. Yeah. And uh, we'll pray that uh, for wisdom. And if I don't have it, I'll be glad to tell you I don't know what I'm talking about. All right. Yeah. Well, we're going to start with this call from Sherry from Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. My name is Sherry. And my question is, do you think that we're going to have a World War III? Okay. Uh, Sherry, I don't think so. I don't think the Lord's going to let this world go into uh, chaos like that. But I do think serious problems are coming on the world. And I, as I see, what's going to happen is a financial collapse will lead some things. We might, beyond that, see some natural disasters. But I, I do not think we're going to have, quote, World War III, but it looks like we're on the brink of it as we go down the line. All right, great answer. Here's one from Winnie from Brevard, North Carolina. My name is Winnie. My question is, why does the world hate Israel? and the Jewish people so much. You know, Satan hates God, and he hates God's people. And the Jews are the example of God's work on earth. They have the oracles of God. We have the scriptures came from Israel. And Israel is the, is the, is the home of, of the Messiah. And so these people take us back to the origins of Christianity, the origins of Judaism, and the origins of faith on earth. And the devil hates that. So if he can destroy Israel, then of course he thinks he can wipe out the, the, the evidence of God Almighty. So the, the Jews have said, I know being chosen is nice, but I'm not sure I want to be chosen for this. Well, that's what they're chosen for. They're chosen to be the, to have the oracles of God and be the representative of the Lord uh, in, in, as a nation, okay? All right, Pat, let's go to Springfield, Missouri for this caller. Uh, yes, I have a question. How do you forgive somebody who has stolen your child out of our house and molested our child, killed our child, and thrown that child in a ditch. I, I can't see forgiving somebody that would do something like that. Um, look, here's the deal. In that condition, whoever did that should go to jail. They should be arrested, and it isn't anything wrong with having the authorities take somebody like that and put them, they ought, perhaps ought to be locked up for life. But as far as you're concerned, God Almighty says, I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you the greatest sin of all. What you've done to me is worse than anybody's done to you. And if I can forgive you, you must forgive others. And that, that's the key. The Bible says when I, you stand praying, if you have ought against any, forgive as your Heavenly Father may forgive you. If you want to see miracles, you have to have a forgiving heart. And if you don't, you will shut off the source of blessing in your life. And, and it, it, you're hurting yourself, okay? Yeah, it's, it's hard. why should she stay in prison in a, a, a the unforgiveness yeah. prison the rest of her life? I mean, it's, don't get me wrong, uh, that's the hardest I, thing I have a, you can ever do. In the early days of CBN, I had a call for somebody who said he's crippled in arthritis and he wants prayer. And I prayed for him. Then he called back. He said, I knew that fellow was a fake. Mm. Uh, he didn't do anything to help me. And I said to him, if you want to be healed, he was in a wheelchair. He said, if you want to be healed, you've got to be reconciled with your wife. Wow. And you know what he said to me? He said, I'd go to hell first. Wow. And he had made himself, his wife ran off with another man. And his little child was crippled, was running after the car, crying out, Mama, Mama, please come back. Mm. And the woman is off with her boyfriend, you know. Yeah. And, and he is, but he had crippled himself, so he had put himself in a, in a, in a prison. Because of unforgiveness. Because of unforgiveness. And yeah. he was having arthritis, and he was crippled. And he said, I'll go to hell first. Well, he already had hell, all right? Yeah, all right. Good word, Pat. All right, here's Linda from Clarksville, Tennessee. Linda. And my question is, with all of the turmoil and fighting in the Middle East, which is talked about in the Bible, and we know it's going to continue, why does America keep on trying to fix a problem 
that there that can't be fixed. The Bible even tells us that. Linda, it's very perceptive what you have to say. Mm -hmm. You know, George Bush tried to do it, and they faked a lot of that stuff that was going on in Iraq. They have weapons of mass destruction. And uh, Afghanistan has been ungovernable all the way back to, uh, uh, you know, the early conquerors of, of uh, you know, the, the, the great uh, Macedonian general. They, they couldn't control those, those countries. And I think the sooner we get out of it, the better off we'll be. But you, you're very perceptive. And I, you say, why are we doing it? Well, I, I, there's something about us that just thinks we can fix other people's problems. And the whole idea of nation building is, is, is really a mistake, OK? All right, here's Doris from Kingman, Arizona. My name is Doris. My question is, is America mentioned in the end times of the Bible? Um, you know, it's it's hard to find it. If you look at, at Ezekiel, when it's talking about the latter days and an invasion of Israel by these Gog and Magog, it says the young lions of Tarshish will stand around. There's a thing in Davenport, Iowa, if you can believe it, there was a, a stell, a, a marking on a, on a rock that said, Travelers from Tarshish have come here hmm. in Davenport, Iowa. Weird. And Tarshish was kind of like the end of the world. When you went past Gibraltar, you were out into this unknown. And so, you see, will we ever mention that's the only place I'm aware of. The United States is just not mentioned. It's the young lines of Tarshish. If you want to read that, America, that, that's, that's the best I can give you, okay? All right. And you think we're the young lions? Well, I'm not, I don't think. But I mean, you said, oh, we mentioned in the Bible. That's the only place I know that for sure you can say America may have been mentioned. May have been mentioned. Interesting. The young lines of Tarshish. Because we're so young. What are we, 250 years yeah, old? Yeah, we're nothing compared <laughs> to the thousands of years of, yeah. of civilization. All right. All right. Here's one from Maria from Anaheim, California. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Maria. My question is, my husband and I are both born-again Christians, but my husband still smokes. Is he committing sin, and is he grieving the Holy Spirit? Um, look, Maria, you're, the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and tobacco will destroy your body. You, you get lung disease, you get Burger's disease, you get all kinds of uh, pathology. The problem is we in the nation, actually as America, we subsidize tobacco. You realize people are paid to grow tobacco? And my dear friend Jesse Helms was in there before. He's from, from North Carolina. And I spoke out a long time ago against tobacco, and he says, well, no friend of North Carolina will speak out against tobacco. That's true. So, Just like I mean, coal in West Virginia, you don't speak yeah, out about see, tobacco. And well, you know, is he going to heaven? Well, I don't think it's going to keep you out of heaven, but it sure does hurt you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we should respect it. And we, But the, we're finally beginning. Uh, it was a long process, so we finally turned the corner. So there are more non-smokers than there are smokers. And now we're talking about secondhand smoke and, and people are beginning to realize that this lung cancer is a serious thing and the secondhand smoke can give you lung cancer. And so they're saying, look, I'm not going to sit in a room with somebody who's going to give me cancer. So mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the predominant feeling about smoking and non-smoking has gone against smoking. And so, but you see, are they going, if somebody's not going to hell because they smoke, but it's, it's just unwise, all right? You just might cut, cut your life short. It, well, that's what it'll do. You, you're committing suicide, but it's, not, it's gradual. You're not aware of it. And unfortunately, it's legal. All right. right. Let's take this call now from Gabrielle from Grand Prairie, Texas. Hi, Pat. My name is Gabe. I was wondering, what would happen if Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party wait to send the articles of impeachment over to the Senate after President Trump is reelected as president? in November 2020. Uh, it's not going to happen that way, Hector. I, I appreciate that, but it's just not going to happen. Uh, she's only got another few more days to get the thing done. And if she doesn't do it, the Senate can go ahead and, and, and take over. As a matter of fact, they can, they can make an article. I mean, they can have a, a majority vote that says we, we just feel these articles are, 
or improper or else we can take it up and we can appoint our own managers. So she's not going to wait until after the election. No way, no way, no how. Plus she's got pressure now from oh, people like Senator yeah, Feinstein exactly. even. So she, She's not going to be able to do that. All right. All right. Hector from Norfolk, Virginia, right here at home. Here's Hector. Hello, Pat. Uh, my name's Hector. My pastor does not think it's important to get involved with politics or cultural transformation because we're going to get raptured pretty soon. Can you discuss the validity of that and where that the idea of the rapture came from? Uh, look, the Bible talks about in the last days, immediately after the tribulation of those days, then shall appear the Son of Man in heaven, and he will send his angels uh, to pick up the redeemed throughout the world, and then he will come with his angels. That's the rapture. The word rapture means I snatch. It means I'm caught up to be. Now, there was this woman in an Irving Eight movement. She was about a 17, 18 year old. She started having these visions and, and dreams and stuff. And there was a man named John Nelson Darby who thought that what he was hearing was God. And his disciple was a man named C.I. Schofield. And Schofield wrote the notes on what is called the Schofield Bible. And all this nonsense, and it is nonsense, about pre-tribulation rapture, about people being caught up and the other being left behind, and then uh, seven years later, the Lord coming back and all that. It just isn't biblical. And but that's that was where it came from. It made some great entertainment, though some great movies. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, what's left his name is the series. Well, he's made a fortune on that Left Behind series, and you know, he Tim LaHaye is he's a good guy, but he's his his theology is just wrong. Okay. All right, here's one from <laughs> Kristen in Austin, Texas. This is Krisha. How do we know? Which promises in the Bible were meant for us today and which were meant for a specific people at a specific time? Well, I think you have to read it in the context of what is, you know, if, if Paul writes that I'm writing to the Thessalonians and <laughs> I want to tell you about something you're supposed to do in Thessalonica and be nice to these two ladies, that isn't something for 2020 in America. So you, you just have to read with discernment as to who you're talking to. It is It is... The recipients, who is who is being addressed, what is the matter at hand, and so forth. But that just takes some discernment. I mean, you just got to. I mean, you you can't. You know, we talk about getting wisdom from the Lord, and somebody say, "Well, I'd, I'd open the Bible, put my hand on a verse, and then uh, he put a hand on the verse and said, no, you know, Judas went out and hanged himself, and then he Dear. opened the Bible and put his hand on another one and said, go and thou and do likewise.' I mean." That, that's that's just Ooh. ripping scripture out of concept. But a scripture like Paul said, um, you know, my grace is, Jesus said, my, my grace is sufficient for you. Well, it's, it's sufficient. And he also, all scripture is, the Bible is, the Greek is theomnustos. It's all God breathed. And it's good for instruction. It's good for uh, doctrine. It's good for correction and so on. But, but at the same time, you have to realize that what he's talking about has to do with the culture that he's in, the people who are the recipients and so forth. You have to read it that way. All right. All right. Here's from, from Issy Kay from Nacogdoche, Louisiana. My name is Izzy, and I'm a 20-year-old female from Louisiana. And as a millennial, it's kind of hard to wake some of my brothers and sisters in Christ up to see what is going on in the world. So my question for you is, what verses can I use to testify to help wake my brothers and sisters in Christ up from deception? What can I do and what can I say to really shake my brothers and sisters out of their sleep? Well, I think that you use the one in the Psalms, great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. And you have to realize, you read what Jesus said, it's not just a verse or two, but read thoroughly. You know, he said, my peace I leave unto you, not as the world gives unto you. I'm going to give you my peace, and I'm going to look after you. And I think that's what you need to read. But it's not just one or two verses. I mean, it's, it's, the Bible is, is filled with hope and blessing and that kind of thing. And that's what you need to look for. I feel like she's 20 years old. She said she's a millennial, and she feels all this pressure to get her siblings saved. You know, that's really up to the Holy Spirit. She can pray yeah. and certainly share some scriptures. Well, but I feel like she's got all this 
pressure on her to get them saved. The Bible says, occupy till I come. And, you know, we've got to be serving the Lord till he come, not speculating on stuff, but or, or, but occupy. And what does he say to do? Preach the word, be faithful in season and out of season. Mm. And that's what he's called us to do. And the Bible says, when you've done all these things, see, we're unprofitable servants. We've done our duty. That's what God called us to do. So he said, occupy till I come. So what do you do? You're supposed to help the poor. You're supposed to help the needy. You're supposed to bring the gospel to the world or to, to the people in your neighborhood. You're supposed to be a witness to the glory of God. That's what you're supposed to do. And you don't have to be worried about some of these speculations, all right? Amen. Wow, Thank these you. are some great questions. Yeah, and they're wonderful questions. Well, coming up, we've got round two of our special edition of Your Questions and Honest Answers, so don't go away. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. We are having a great time taking your questions today. And Pat is giving some amazing answers. We're going to start again with round two. Cynthia from Bemel, Texas. Here's Cynthia. Hello, my name is Cynthia. I have a stepson who is gay, who is engaged to be married. I have two young school age children, six and 15. They have been invited to be in the wedding. That goes against all my beliefs. My question is, how do you love someone through this and still stand in your beliefs and still say no, that you don't agree with it? Do we still visit? Oh, Cynthia, you can visit and you can love them. I, I think if, if somebody is carrying on a, an activity that you feel is unbiblical, you still want to love the person. You, you love them. You, you, it is the thing is you hate the sin, but you love the sinner. But in terms of participating, you're talking about participating in a wedding of two homosexuals married together, which you feel is contrary to the Bible. And I don't think there's anything in the Bible that will require you to be loving, but participate. You, you've got to say no. And these people will have to realize that the conduct they're doing in your eyes is wrong. And unless you show that, then they won't realize that they're doing something wrong. So. And she's got the two children that she's raising, and yeah. they're watching what's going exactly. on. Exactly. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. She has to do it in love, yeah. kindly say well, no. You, you just have to do that. I mean, you know, the, sooner or later, they, they'll, they'll come to the realization of the Lord. But you, if you participate, then, of course, they will enter further into this lifestyle, and you don't want them to do that. What did I say? You love the sinner, you hate the sin. What's next? All right. Here's one from Martha from Haddon Heights, New Jersey. My name is Martha. My question for Pat is, what are you doing to stay so fit and so healthy at your young age? Well, I, I tell you, as, as somebody said, I chose my ancestors wisely. <laughs> uh, but um, I, 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 I really look after myself. I eat very uh, properly. I eat a lot of vegetables and fruits and that kind of thing. I don't eat a lot of meat, and I, I stay off of sweets pretty much. But uh, in addition, I do work out. I've got a total gym at home. I've got some other weight or equipment and, and a weight bench and everything. And so I, I work out and stay, stay, try to stay fit. And... Uh, you know, I've lost a lot of weight. I've lost about 60 pounds, and I, 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 don't, I don't know how it happened. All of a sudden, I didn't have any appetite, so I just... Well, I don't know any other 89-year-olds going on 90 that host their own TV show every day. Uh, do you? I don't, I don't know of that happening anywhere. I may have set a record, but the <laughs> main thing, I stay in prayer. I mean, I'm, I, you know, great peace have they that love thy law. And I, I, I have peace because I, I, I love Jesus, and I ask for his anointing, and... Um, I, I pray. I mean, when I was in my time of prayer over the, over the holidays, I said, God, I, I just want those things. I want to have wisdom and, and anointing and favor. I, I want to have wisdom. Give me an understanding of what you, you want in life. And when you have this, God renews our strength like the eagles. Okay. He promises to give us strength for our days. He does, day by day by day. All right. All right. Thanks, Pat. Well, Tammy from Columbia, South Carolina, has this call. Hello, my name's Tammy. My question is, um, does it say anywhere in the Bible that tells us we should be buried and not cremated? Hmm. Um, 
in the Old Testament, when somebody's burned, bones were burned, it was a sign of disrespect. They would dig up the bones of the dead people and burn them. And a legitimate burial, you know, uh, Abraham bought the uh, field uh, in, in uh, Mamre at, in order to bury his mm. spouse. And they said, bury your dead. And he got that cave and he paid money for it. But th there was a sign of respect. And I, I don't know of anything that, that we, we cremate people all the time now. And it's probably saves a lot of money and you get them cremated and you don't have to worry about a big plot of ground and all that expense. But at the same time, I, I think it's disrespect. And in the, in the Old Testament, it was a sign of, of hatred that you would dig up somebody's bones and burn them. And uh, the, uh, people were honored by, by being uh, preserved. And sort of the Egyptians had all that uh, thing that they did for these mummies. Mm -hmm. But um, anyhow, that, that's what I feel. I, I think Christian burial does not include cremation. Okay, good all work. Right. Here's a caller from Dodge City, Kansas. Our church says there is no denomination mentioned in the Bible. Since Jesus was not denominational, what do you say that the Bible says about denominations? Uh, well, you know, when Paul was writing those letters, he would say the Church of God in Philippi, the Church of God in Corinth, and so they were all together in one place. And denominations have risen up. The Bible says that we we hold the truth, we 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 maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace until we come into the unity of the faith. And you see, the problem is. Presbyterian, Presbyterian is the way you, you, is a type of government. Mm -hmm. Methodism is, is that um, John Wesley was, had a, a method to, to follow. And that was, it was, it was his set of rules. Um, Episcopal has to do with bishops, the Episcopos. Uh, you know, the Catholics have a pope and they have their, their way of thinking. The Bible says, again, we maintain the unity of the spirit till we come in to a perfect man under the knowledge of the truth. We haven't gotten there yet, but um, you know, this, it's sort of a good thing and a bad thing, but the idea we're split because I'm Presbyterian, you're Baptist, you're Lutheran, you're, you're um, the Church of God, you're something. Um, well, you know, and then the Methodist Church, I guess, just split over the issue of oh, homosexuality. Can you believe that? So, you know, you, you might have a denomination yeah. and, it, and it might split because of different ideologies. Many of them have split. You've got Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy, your various one. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's human uh, uh, resentment. That's why I like non-denominational. Yeah. <laughs> There's a plenty of non-denominational churches well, out there. I'm a little bit of everything. I, I, yeah. I believe in the uh, believe baptism of the, of the saints, the, of the believer's baptism. I believe in so many of those things. I take a little piece of all of it. But I think we're called to love each other. That's the big thing. And I'm not at war because I say I'm a Baptist. I'm not at war with the Catholics. I'm not at war with the Presbyterians. I'm not at war with the Episcopalians. But right. I think we need to understand where they came from. All right. That's right. Okay, good, good stuff. All right, here's one from Emporia, Virginia. Yes, my question is, should a sinner take communion? And also, will God answer your prayers if you're not saved? Uh, the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. If I'm looking at it myself, you see, in order to have unity, if two of you agree, well, where's the agreement? Your spirit has got to agree with the Holy Spirit. And if your spirit is condemning yourself, then you can't agree with the Holy Spirit, you, and you're not going to have a miracle. You just won't do it. So if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. And uh, what was the other so question? How do you, so how do you get how do you get there? Do you forgive yourself? Do you ask for forgiveness, and well, then you well, can have unity with the Holy Spirit? Well, you have to be doing the right thing. If you know you're sinning, uh, there are many people that know very well they're doing something wrong, but they keep on doing it. And then the other question was about communion. Can you take well, communion? Well, Paul said, 
the people who come to the table of the Lord in an unworthy fashion are bringing condemnation on themselves. And because of this, some are sick and some die. Mm. And, you know, the Baptists say, well, it's a sacrament. It's a, it's a uh, uh, memorial. Well, memorials don't kill people. But th this is a very serious matter. When you take communion, it's really the body and blood of Jesus Christ. If you really take it seriously, and you take it, and you know you sin in your life. You're doing terrible things, but you go ahead and take communion anyhow. You're, you're, that's what the Bible says. You're eating and drinking condemnation on yourself. Wow. I, that, I didn't write it, folks. So make sure you're right with God before you take it. Amen. And so, you know, right the let a man confess when you get ready to take the communion, you ask God to forgive you and, and cleanse you before you go into that very sacred moment. All right. Okay. Good word. Here's one from uh, Elmer from Grand Junction, Colorado. Hi, my name is Elmer. I have a question of uh, how God says he forgives all sins, but then at the end time, he's going to judge everybody. If he forgives you for all your sins, why are you being judged? Well, uh, the Bible doesn't say he forgives everybody's sin. Uh, he forgives those who have come to him and asked for forgiveness and have accepted Jesus as Savior. Um, there are two types of, of judgment. One has to do with the bema, the judgment seat of Christ, when there are going to be rewards passed out, and there will be a certain amount of judgment on people who've known what God want them to do, but they haven't done it. So you talk about those that knew the Lord's will and, and didn't do it, they'll be beaten with few stripes. Those that knew the Lord's will and didn't do it will be beaten with many stripes. There'll, there'll be a judgment, you know, uh, last time. But the, the, the final judgment is what's called the great white throne, when the books will be open and all the world will be before Almighty God. And the Bible says that he that has come to the Lord uh, and accept him uh, will not come into the judgment, but is passed from Jeff death into life. If I have come to Jesus Christ and believe that he is and receive the Lord as my Savior, then I'm not coming into that final judgment. But there is a final judgment. And believe me, there's, you know, People think they want to get away with it because they can just live any way they want to. And I'm going to have a good time. And when I'm in hell, it'll be a time of party. It'll be an awful time. It'll be separation from God. Hell is awful to contemplate for all eternity. Mm. That's what hell is. For all eternity, you'll be having a conscience to say, I could have come to the Lord and lived in paradise forever. Instead, I am away from the Lord and I'm here forever and ever and ever. That's what, that's what the last judgment is going to be about. Okay? Wow. That's scary. Thanks, Pat. Thank Very you. great answers. Well, still ahead, more of your voicemail questions. Round three of this special edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers. That's coming up next. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. A judge in Brazil ordered Netflix to stop showing a Christmas special that depicts Jesus as a gay man. The movie is called The First Temptation of Christ. The film's creators defended it as legitimate freedom of expression. A Brazilian Catholic organiza organization argued that the honor of millions of Catholics is damaged by the movie. The judge said withdrawing the program is, quote, beneficial not only for the Christian community, but to the Brazilian society, which is mostly Christian. Well, Chick-fil-A CEO Dan Cathy says his company is not abandoning faith-based organizations, just, sh just, sh just shifting focus. In a letter to the American Family Association, Cathy responded to criticism for no longer giving to the Salvation Army or the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. He told the AFA's Tim Wildman, quote, we inadvertently discredited several outstanding organizations organizations that have effectively served communities for years and said the company is open to donating to such organizations in the future. Well, you can find the story and read Kathy's full letter at CBNNews.com and find all the latest news of the day there as well. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Welcome back to the 700 Club and the special edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers from Pat. We're going to start with round three. We've got this call and question from Nancy from Haymarket, Virginia. Hey, Nancy. 
Hi, this is Nancy. My question for Pat is, will we know our family members in heaven? Will we see them and will we be able to interact with them? And where does it say that in the Bible? Um, I, I think with that question, we're going to recognize the family members. Uh, but uh, the Bible, you know, there's a story in the Bible that Jesus is talking about a rich man and a beggar who went to heaven, and the rich man uh, you know, was in Abraham's bosom, and, and, and he was being tormented. And he told Abraham, I've got family back in there. Let me go to them. And, they, and Abraham says, they've got Moses and the prophets, and that's it. But um, I, I do believe that when we're in heaven, there's no question about it, that there will be joyous reunions. I, I don't think, again, that dead people are looking down from heaven and, and observing what's going on in your life. I, I think that's a mistake, because it opens up to spiritism and witchcraft and familiar spirits and all that stuff. But I do think when we're in heaven, there's going to be joyous reunions. Those who've gone, you know, the Bible says, you know, those who, who die in Christ shall not go behind uh, those who are alive. And so when the Lord will descend, we are alive, will be called up to be in the Lord, and we'll therefore all be with the Lord. So the people who die in Christ will go up, and we will go up. That's the rapture. And I think we will be there together, and there will be incredible reunions. And the Bible says He'll wipe every tear away from their eyes, mm -hmm. and there will be nothing but joy. There will be no pain, no suffering, no sorrow for all eternity. And yes, we will see our loved ones, okay? Beautiful. All right, here's one, a call from, or a question rather, from Jennerette from Louisiana. Is the rapture and tribulations really mentioned in the Bible? I did research and read they were invented in the 19th century by a man named John Nelson Darby. And is the United States one of the seven heads of the beast mentioned in Revelations? I don't know that we're the seven heads of any beast. I, I don't see that. But uh, the answer that Jordan Nelson or Darby is exactly right. Uh, but uh, this rapture, there's going to be a rapture. The rapture, the word rapio is I snatch, and we will be caught up to be with the Lord. But the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout of command, and the dead in Christ will rise. And the Bible says immediately after the tribulation, there's going to be a tribulation, a severe testing where the sun and the moon won't be visible. I think we're looking at the possibility of volcanic explosions or maybe an asteroid hitting the earth or something. But it will, it will obliterate the sun and the moon. And there'll be uh, trouble in the stars and the sky and great pestilence and so forth. But that is short-lived, and immediately after the tribulation, then you'll see the Son of Man in heaven, and you will be called up to be with the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay. So the rapture and the second coming are the same thing. Yes, they, they are. They are. They're not the same thing, but they they are. They they are one. They, they go together. They, they go together. One one precedes the other, but you know, he comes back, and then he sends his angels and gathers his elect from the four corners of the earth. Got it. All, All right. right. Here's a caller from La Follette, Tennessee. When we get to heaven, will we have a free will? And if we do, might we sin also, as Lucifer did? <laughs> That's, I'm sure you, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be in the presence of God. It will be so overwhelmingly glorious when we're standing in His presence, I'm going to be with God, and I'll be like Him because I'll see Him as He is. Mm -hmm. And I will be in His presence, and His love will fill me, and I'll be so much in love with Him, I don't know what to do. I mean, everything in my life will be taken away. You see, Satan had decided he was going to be greater than God. He, he, he was the anointed uh, cherub that covered the very holiness of God. And somewhere along the way, iniquity was found in him. And he began to look at himself and said, I am so beautiful. And I can run this universe better than God can. But that is, so pride was the first sin. But I mean, the average person doesn't think he can run the universe better than God. If he does, he's crazy. Uh, you know. Yeah, totally nuts. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm in the presence of God. It's so wonderful. It's so glorious. Why would anybody want to go away from God? Only somebody who who had was distorted in his mind, uh, who thought he could run the universe. Of course, you know we've got that song. I did it my way, 
And it's, it's kind of that kind of thing. You know, whatever happened, I did it my way. That's that Satan spirit, all right? All right. Here's one from Malcolm from Lawton, Oklahoma. Hi, my name is Malcolm. My question is, what covenant are we considered under today? And do we have to obey the commandments? Do we have to abide by the dietary laws? Uh, you remember Jesus said that he, he made all foods clean. Uh, he said, you know, whatever you, you eat or drink, it just goes into your stomach and is passed out in the draught. But said what, what corrupts a man is what's in his heart, mm -hmm. uh, adultery and uh, slander. and. So bacon is okay. The bacon, bacon is okay. <laughs> I think we're free from the dietary laws. Exactly right. That, that, listen, some of those things are pretty smart. I mean, you eat shellfish that's been breeding the out yeah, in some sewer, and and yeah. you'll get you'll get allergies. And you know, the, some of those dietary laws are very smart. But it's not a religious thing. It's just a health thing. Yeah. Okay. You want it? Oysters from fresh, from nice water, clean I water. I don't eat oysters anymore. I used to eat oysters, but yeah. they, there's so much stuff, you know. Filtered through and them. They're filter fish. Many people have have allergies to shellfish because they're out there eating that stuff in the, out in the sewers. Ooh. And so, anyhow. Gross. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here's a question from Ken from Nashville, Tennessee. Yes, my name is Ken, and my question is, is using the term, oh, my God, taking the Lord's name in vain. Um, I, I think it's disrespectful, but, you know, I noticed some of the Jews, they say G blank D, like somehow they're not breaking the commandment. The Lord's name is Yahweh, Yehovah. And it's, it's in Hebrew, it's the hifil of the uh, word to be. And his name is he who causes everything to be. And so, when you're swearing by his name or you're cursing by his name, you're talking about Jehovah. You're not talking about using the name God. And, and so if somebody thinks, I'm going to say G blank D, like somehow I'm, I'm, I'm holy. Well, that's, in my opinion, it's nonsense. Well, most, most Christians say, oh, my gosh. So well, I don't know I, I, if that's I, I, I know. allowed either, but that's no, what we it's say. it's the same thing. Yeah. Oh, gosh, oh, golly. I mean, all those things. And they used to, the, the uh, British used to say bloody, you know. Oh, yeah, that, and that goes well, back the to blood the blood of Jesus blood Christ. Of Jesus. And, and so it, it, is, it is disrespectful, but it's not breaking the commandment. The commandment has to do with the actual name of God, mm. which is, is Yahweh. Is, is, that, that's who the commandment's about, all right? All right, thanks, Pat. Here's a question from Catherine from New Haven, Kentucky. My name is Catherine. I used to work in public work, but now I am disabled. My husband takes all of his overtime money and puts it in a separate account for himself. He drinks all the time, every day, and uh, he says he has to have that money for himself. Is it right for him to do so when I've got medical bills and bills need to be paid? You know what the Bible says? It's very clear. If any man will not take care of his own, he's worse than an infidel. He's denied the faith. And for a man to take money... Now, did she say the source of the money was hers? No, it was his, his overtime. overtime. Only not his main paycheck, but, but his he, overtime he in a separate account. for drinking and whatever. Well, he shouldn't do it, but I don't know how you can stop it. Uh, you can get some kind of a, a decree about it, but it's wrong. You know, if anybody that won't look after his own, and, and I just he's keep gonna, praying for the Holy Spirit to convict him because yeah. I don't. He's not. He's not going to listen to her at this point. Probably not. But, he, but he'll listen to the Holy. The Holy Spirit knows how to well, how to talk to him. It's going to take that and maybe an intervention. But mm -hmm. what he's doing is wrong, and the fact that it's a separate account, he's going to get drunk on it. I mean, he's hurting himself too. All right. All right. We've got this uh, question from Tracy from Lebanon, Tennessee. Hi, my name is Tracy, and I'm calling in reference to the specific um, topic of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible, and I believe that had to do with homosexuality, but there's other people, um, I believe, that's in the gay and lesbian community that say that that is not mentioned in there. They say it's more about raping of a woman, and I do believe that it had to do with homosexuality, so I wanted Pat to answer that question for me. The term sodomy, by the way, comes from Sodom and Gomorrah, and it has to do with homosexuality. 
Those people actually want to rape angels. There are angels staying at Lot's house, and they, <clears throat> they broke down the door, and they said, come out, we want to have sex with these strangers. Mm. I mean, they wanted, these men were so depraved, and that's when the judgment of God fell on them. But when you read the Bible, it, it says pride, fullness of bread, and careless ease. That, that was the sin. Pride, fullness of bread, and careless ease. And, and the Bible doesn't say, of course, they were homosexuals. Pride, fullness of bread, careless ease. That's what the, they were the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, wow. according to the Bible. You know what I mean? That's amazing. Yeah, okay. Well, well Pat, thank you so much. This has been well, fun. This has been fun. I hope we can maybe do another one. I, 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 you questions are marvelous. Thank you so much. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Isaiah. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Well, tomorrow, the race for the White House, what's at stake for Christians? Charisma editor Steve Strang is going to be with us. Hopefully, he's got the answer. <laughs> See you later.